uh, as we get started. Uh, thank you all for coming to our panel, Bridging the Gap. Uh, and on this panel, you will all be experts on bridges of all kinds, uh, cantilever, wood, silicon, arts. <laughs> No, this panel is actually about uh, representing middle spectrum characters uh, that lie outside of what we traditionally see with either straight white space marine or uh, you know giant flaming stereotype. Uh, it's kind of these uh, characters that aren't uh, aren't well represented um, that sit within the middle of the spectrum. Uh, so, quick introductions. Um, my name is Adam Rickert. Uh, I am the creative head at Salsa Bear Studios. Um, I'm an artist and UI designer. Hi, I'm George Higa. I'm the head of development for Salsa Bear Studios and the sort of run everything business related to it. Great. Um, so, just a question for the audience. Uh, you know, when's the last time you saw any of these in a game? Disabled character, a homeless character, someone living with HIV or AIDS, uh, an old queer person? If hell, when's the last time you saw one of those in real life? Uh, <laughs> A uh, person of size that wasn't included as a joke, or a queer character that you even truly identified with. Um, so, part of the reason we wanted to do this talk is about uh, representation and why it's important to have these things, well, have these things included. Um, it, it's interesting. While I was uh, doing research for this panel, um, I would pitch the idea to people, and they would ask me, "Well, why? Why do we need gay games? Why do we need gay characters?" And I was, I was kind of flabbergasted by that question because it usually came from gay people, which doesn't make any sense to me. Anyway, <laughs> the, um, so some of the reasons why representation is important is we're able to tell our own story if we're writing our own story. We're not leaving uh, our representation up to straight white dudes. You know, if we're, if we're actually doing our writing, doing our development, uh, writing and making our own games, uh, those stories are coming from us, and the only way you're going to get authentic representation is by lived experience. So, you know, who's better to tell the stories than the people that have lived that? Um, it also gives uh, positive role models for future generations. You know, a big thing that I've seen, that I've seen through a lot of uh, this convention and the Game Developers Conference is people talking about how when they were children they would uh, play a certain uh, game and there would be a certain character that really resonated with them and they're like, oh, I see myself in that character. And up to this point we're kind of, we've been stifled with that. And so it's kind of uh, a, the onus is on us as we go forward to create more diverse role models so that as people come up they are seeing themselves represented in the games. Uh, we, have the, we have the ability to uh, advance our own social issues faster when we're making our own games as well. Um, the AAA industry is notoriously glacial at uh, moving on social issues. Um, they tend to move very cautiously, follow the money, don't make a lot of big uh, bold moves. Um, but indies aren't really restrained by that. So we're in this position where we can make our own stories. We can make really outlandish games about, you know, trying to fit three people on a bed or, you know, any of the stuff that we've seen at the con here. Um, we're, we're able to do, to uh, tell these stories and kind of get the, uh, the ball rolling on these issues a lot faster and a lot more uh, vocally than, um, than our uh, bigger counterparts. Um, and the next one is, um, Clearly the one that, that uh, I think the most people understand is validation. Uh, it's being able to say to our players, um, you know, I see you, I recognize you, and without asking or needing it, I'm validating you without judgment or pity. You know, I, I see you as a person, I, I know who you are, and I'm telling you that you are important to our cause. Um, I think, honestly, I think that's the most important part of representation, is that just being able to see ourselves reflected in our games. Um, and then the last one is uh, self-identification or community building. So, you know, we're able to build communities of people with like minds um, and also who identify similarly uh, with, these, with these kind of games. So we can make, um, you know, games about trans issues, we can make games about people of color and, and the issues that they deal with. Um, and people will resonate with those games and then those communities will form around it. So, um, An interesting thing that I came across, uh, one of the talks at GDC a couple years ago came with this idea of identity tourism. And this is, an interesting, this is interesting for the fact that this is how the straight audience actually benefits from us having more diversity. 
identity tourism is the process of appropriating another identity on the web, um, which usually involves another gender or race than your own. And so it's kind of being a, uh, being able to see another person's experience without actually having to go through it. Uh, and as a result, it's like if we have more diverse characters, then even the straight white bros can have these other opinions and these other viewpoints to, to kind of uh, look to and experience. And, and it'll only help to have uh, more exposure because the faster and the more widespread we have more exposure, we get more normalization in, in, uh, in our communities and within society as a whole. So uh, something that, that I thought was interesting with uh, uh, recently some, some of the offerings that the industry has had, um, I went to go see How to Train Your Dragon 2, and there was this big hoopla about them including a gay character, and the media went absolutely apeshit over it. And uh, the character was just one character, and I'm glad they chose the one they did because he, he was missing limbs, and he was kind of like, he had a lot of interesting things to him. But the one, uh, but the only reason that he was considered queer was because he had one line where he said, "That's why I didn't get married." Oh, and one other reason. <laughs> and the news articles about it called it brave, and I was like, I was kind of insulted by it. It's like, how do you, how do you call this brave when you're not even admitting it? You're not even saying the character is gay. Like, we're, I feel like we're at this. What if the character is asexual? Oh, same, same point. Yeah, it's. It, I guess my view on it is, if you're gonna pander, don't half-ass it. Either full-ass it or don't ass it at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, like I, don't want, I don't want you to just throw me some breadcrumbs and be like, oh, we threw in a black character, we threw in a gay character, oh, you, that's enough, right? Like, that's just insulting. We're at a point now where we should be demanding more out of it. We should be saying, oh, well, you've got a gay character, but he's not interesting, and he's a background character. Or, oh, you've got a trans character, but again, they're a prostitute. What? Like, we need to get out of this, this uh, kind of roadmap of having our, our characters are included as kind of a token checklist, but they're not interesting, they're not relevant, they're really more kind of a set dressing, if anything. Um, so that's one thing I thought was, was kind of uh, interesting, because we're seeing a lot of this, uh, this happening where uh, people are realizing that gay characters are kind of ne a necessity, but they're adding them in really small and piecemeal, and ultimately we don't get very interesting characters out of it. We get these kind of like shallow ch tropes and they don't uh, expand much on them. So the first thing we're going to talk about um, with regards to kind of uh, different groups to incorporate um, is characters with differing beauty, beauty standards. Uh, currently, our, we see a lot of uh, characters with tattoos, piercings, um, mostly Caucasian and either thin or muscle or what they consider healthy, uh, which is a very loaded word because it, is, it implies that if you aren't what they consider healthy, then you must be unhealthy. Um, things we still have a long way to go on, people of color, different ethnicities, uh, people of size, uh, people with birth deformities um, and body modification, so uh, disabled characters. Um, we still got a long way to go on these, uh, these particular issues, um, among other things. So we actually are making a, for this talk specifically, we're making a, a, um, a deliberate decision. We're not really covering gender issues or, um, or race issues. This is more about uh, kind of markets that are uh, not very talked about. So we've got a lot of talks about uh, about those issues and they're they're important and relevant, but they're they're also huge and they lie kind of outside the scope of this talk. Um, so this is uh, kind of going into our first uh, first real group um, is in the gay community specifically. We kind of run into this trap of masculine and feminine, where uh, masculinity is uh, kind of put on a pedestal, um, and a even in the uh, the gay community, we find that. Gay men that are effeminate tend to be looked down upon, uh, and there's a priority kind of put to masculine, and this is internalized homophobia, internalized misogyny, um, rearing its head, and we get to this point where the uh, gay characters we see, if they are included as a uh, effeminate character, they tend to be villains a lot of times, and this is uh, just an old movie trope too. Uh, if you look at uh, Wreck-It Ralph, the main character there was this you know, a flamboyant, uh, Candy King, and that's it was entirely a throwback to most of the you know time when our uh, 
presence in media kind of consisted of either being a, a, a flaming villain or a tragic dying AIDS victim or a fabulous accessory to some straight woman. You know, the, those are the categories that we've kind of uh, we've kind of come from, and we're seeing a lot more representation outside of that now, but it's really slow moving. Um, so we're kind of, we run into this trap now where we want to include gay characters and we want people to identify with them, uh, but we have to be conscious of not putting a value judgment on having masculinity being better or worse, uh, or having femininity being better or worse, because there's a, a huge spectrum. You can have uh, masculine looking characters that are quite effeminate. You can have effeminate looking characters that are actually quite masculine in their actions. Um, so it's a little harder to uh, pick apart those things uh, without uh, placing a value judgment on them. Um, you know, perfect example, like we've got just a huge spectrum of people. There's no, no template, there's no baseline for, for saying this is what a gay man is, this is what a lesbian is. Um, so yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, our next talk is probably the more uh, neglected group in the discussions about how do you put gay characters into gaming um, by the communities of bears, otters, and others of size. So, we do happen to have in gaming the straight version of bears, woods, and otters, such as Zangief from Street Fighter IV. <laughs> Bixby from <laughs> Telltale Games, The Wolf Among Us. And Nathan Drake from Uncharted and... Uh, Booker DeWitt from yeah, Booker Bioshock Infinite. It's but, been, actually, go back to the last slide. Um, isn't this kind of a scathing indictment of the industry and their kind of choices of how they make characters? Like, these are two separate games. By different, <laughs> by different developers, and the characters are almost identical. Like yeah. straight white dude, you know, like forties, brown hair. What, what the hell? They, you know, and this is kind of what we see as being um, promoted as the, um, like the default character because it's considered to be like the most or the least offensive to people. It's like the most relatable, um, and as a result, yeah, we get carbon copies. Like it's the same, same dude. I mean, they're already wearing holsters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even though one has a shotgun. Like, <laughs> he's clearly different because he has a shotgun. <laughs> and he's playing with his mascot. So there's their nod to the gay to the gay people. Okay, so but what we do have to have is a problem with characters of size in gaming. Generally they are a supporting character and they follow stereotypes. Lazy, slow, unintelligent, and gorging themselves, not just on food, but more of a lack of self-control and an overindulgence into these. Or sometimes they're just the tank. And they're usually always alone. There's no relationship that they have on the side or things. It's just, I'm just there. But some of the more popular things in game we see are Peach from Beyond Good and Evil, The Heavy from Team Fortress 2, Murray from the Sly Cooper series, Bob from Tekken, King Hippo. So this this one's kind of interesting. And this, Rufus. This, yeah, R Rufus from Street Fighter. Four. Um, a lot of these characters, uh, especially uh, um, in the last couple slides here, they are defined by their weight. They they're they're a fat character first, and we don't really know much about them other than that when we look at them. Um, and that's kind of the problem is we see them we see them included. We're like, oh great, we got a fat guy in here, but it's presented kind of as a uh, as a prop more than a person. You know, they're, they're defined by the by body size. Um, and the carnival aspect. Exactly. Yeah, he looks like a balloon, <laughs> and that's part of the problem here is that they're not real. Not they're not realistic representations. These characters don't look or feel capable. They feel buffoonish. Uh, it's kind of they're put in there as to be uh, a fool, and it's, uh, you're making a mockery of them. Um, and that's kind of the thing you want to avoid if you're adding. Uh, heavier characters, you, know, you want to make them feel capable and not uh, kind of make a character that feels like it would have dignity in itself um, versus something that's just kind of there to, for a joke. Right. And speaking of that, even in the video by Valve for Team Force 2 with the heavy, it follows exactly all of these stereotypes where he admits that he is unintelligent, where he only cares about. Yes. <laughs> yeah, his sandwiches, but his gun 
Sasha, you know, <laughs> nobody touches it, and he's like, it's four hundred thousand dollars to, you know, to fire it for twelve seconds, and it's, and he goes around, he laughs at all the dark carnage he's doing, and he's like, some people can, you know, outsmart me, that may be so, but you can't outrun the bullet. But it's just very glaring how. You know, they're seeing the heavy. As opposed to every other video about all the other characters who aren't him. He's, he's very single minded. Yeah. He's got a very sing singular goal. Some, um, some other characters that we, we don't have uh, slides for, but um, uh, Edmund Honda from um, Street Fighter is a classic example of kind of a character that's actually done more right. Um, if you look at him as a character, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's a, lar a large character, but he's not put in a way where. Um, he looks incapable. You know, he seems like a like he carries his body mass uh, in a natural way, and he can fight back. And he actually seems like a capable character. Um, Doctor Eggman from Sonic uh, is another one where he's kind of kind of like this character, where he's a balloon character, and um, and also Wario from the Mario series um, is another one where he's uh, kind of. Uh, more of a more of a fool character, but in that case, it kind of makes sense because it's more of a cartoony series. Yeah. So, but now we're in media, in the mainstream media, we've tended to be more corrected in this position. We've given them lead roles. We've given them, we've allowed them to hold a variety of jobs, both blue and white collar, as well as being either stay-at-home parents or work from home and they're all completely capable with modern family we have the character of Cameron who's not only can be a teacher or stay-at-home dad but the football coach you know because he was looking for a job and they happened to need one and his experience allowed him to bring that but he could still be gay um, and from the series from where the bears are well it is an exaggeration, you know, written by bears, for bears, you still can see people who can be corners, the chief corners, who could be detectives, who can be models, travel writers, bartenders, and actors. I think the important thing for where the bears are is that the characters are actually portrayed as being sexy, even though they're larger size. That, that, that part, it seems like, very... Uh, a monumental piece uh, that I saw was that, and it doesn't matter what their body size is, but they're they're portrayed as like having uh, having self confidence about it and owning it, and not being not feeling like they have to be ashamed of it, and actually like kind of owning their sexuality around it. So, as like everything, it's up to us to be able to put you know queer main protagonists into our games to show. The industry for that these can't that it's okay to do this. There's a way to do this, and these can't sell, which is a big stopping point for a lot of triple A's wanting to do this. You're following the money. Yes. <laughs> so the first tip you know, is we have to establish a baseline and a relatability to these characters. Mm -hmm. There is time, um, there is a context of the every man of the. It, they don't have to be stereotyped. They can be anything you want them to be. If you want them to be the gun-toting, you know, savior of the human race, they can be. Or if you just want them to be a doctor. Uh, the reason it's important is because we want to allow the player to identify with this protagonist in a better way than um, gays in gaming have been able to be identified with. You need a move. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so also when it comes to romance and gestures, we can put them in more subtly so that they can be accepted more easily. Um, in the current frat culture of the bromance, if we don't have to do the bromance, but if we start to take elements from it, and displayed it to our characters, you can get this more, the hugging, the, you know, the being there for one another. I think, I think that kind of uh, yeah. uh, falls in the line of uh, normalizing relationships between men without a sexual component. Um, that's largely what, the, what bromance is about, is like two straight dudes 
uh, being okay enough to kind of uh, be you know, really friendly and physical with each other without it uh, kind of being gay, so to speak. Um, so some more tips for kind of making a relatable queer protagonist um, is don't define them by their sexuality. You know, don't make the gay character, and this is something that's come up in a lot of other panels, you don't want to make a character that's defined by their one thing. You don't want to make the fat guy. You don't want to make the trans woman. You don't want to make the black character. You don't want to make a character that is their, their single dimension that way. Um, and the way to do that is give them lived life experience. If you want a character that's going to be interesting, give them backstories that are relatable. You know, if it's a gay character, they have they'll generally have a coming out story of some kind. They'll have a family history, you know, were they, were they a foster child, were they abused at home, you know, what, did they do drugs at some point? There, there's a lot of uh, deep, interesting stuff that can be dredged up out of that, uh, out of the history that um, isn't really taken into account with a lot of characters. They kind of flesh it over as like, oh, this character looks interesting, but they're just, you know, just completely blank as a, blank as a slate. Um, yeah, when it comes to, um realistic romantic options we need to be more well there are certain games out there like the ones from Bioware that have given us the options to pursue gay romances they're often limited to what you can do such as the the blue alien who can be bisexual but I think with uh, yeah. Giving props to Bioware, they made leaps and bounds as far as like adding in gay romances. Um, the main beef that I have with, with games like uh, ones made by Bioware is that um, they're, they're what I consider an avatar-based characters. So you can choose a character, and you can be Shepard, or you can be female Shepard, and they are, you know, all your romance options are totally bisexual, and it doesn't matter who, you know, who romances who, there's no definitive thing stating, okay, this character is just gay, this character is just straight, and they won't, uh, they won't engage in that kind of romance. Um, and there are, there are exceptions to that, uh, the Bioware, you know, just all our games across the board have been uh, pretty good about um, including kind of, uh, more and more options for it, um, especially with the new Dragon Age character uh, that's just gay, which is, you know, to me it's really interesting that we can, we finally hit a point where we can say, okay, well we're giving romance options and it's a realistic one. He won't engage with females because he's a realistic gay character. Um, but in the original Dragon Age, you know, you were still, we are still sort of limited by the only true romance that if you're playing the male character you could have was with the elf. There was yeah, no, you couldn't go. get with the human, male, or the dwarf unless you went to, you know, sleep with the great prostitute. They were the hot ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and again, the last part is don't feel the need to rely on stereotypes or tropes to define your characters. But if we take all of these into consideration, we come up with at least in mainstream media, one person who seems to follow these rules almost to a T, and that's Captain Jack Harkness from Doctor Who and Torchwood fame. He's still able to be masculine heroic, but he's able to do things that we don't generally assume with the straight masculine characters, such as being able to smile or laugh, be tender, be romantic. But I think this, this sums up Captain Jack. He makes the spenders look sexy. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting thing about this character is um, he's not defined solely by violence. A lot, of straight, a lot of straight characters, their masculinity is defined by how well they do violence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and with Tom Jack, you got to sort of get the whole package. Not only because he's not always turning to the violent solution unless it is the option that needs to be pursued. So, but an important part to all of this is we have to understand that there's a thing called audience-dependent relatability. Depending on who you're making for the audience, you're going to have to make a choice on the type of character you're making. If you're making a game for a purely queer audience, it's okay to have the Jack character. Because, as we've seen, Jack's not always just Jack. I think this relates uh, yeah. to, uh, yeah, I mean, you want to you figure out who your audience is, and if you're making a game that is focused on a very specific subsection of it, um, you can make 
deliberate decisions to make kind of more stereotypical characters. Um, but I think the main thing regarding that is the decision should be deliberate and not default. It shouldn't be like, oh, well, we're adding in a gay character, he automatically is a flaming drag queen. Like that shouldn't be, uh, that shouldn't be the way that it's done. If you're if you're putting these characters in, make deliberate decisions to make them interesting and and add them in as characters and flesh them out. All right. Sort of in this case where we have Will, which is more fleshed out. But when we come to romance in the game, man, we have to remember that homomance is equal to heteromance. Okay. Sounds like magic. <laughs> but the only difference is the parties involved. And so if two, a guy and a girl, it's two guys or two girls in these cases. But this can be done well because of Sage Row 4. considered on, on the same par with books and plays and movies about being able to tackle large serious issues, we're not going to be able to really move past that. Um, you know, part of this is like, uh, you know, we can see in movies we can tackle issues like uh, HIV and AIDS. You know, when is the game industry going to get to the point where we can tackle these same issues? When do we get our version of the normal heart? When do we get our version of we were here? When do we get our version of how to survive a plague? Um, you know, these, these kind of uh, stories that tell uh, you know, a, a history of, of our experience as a, you know, as a community. Um, so the first, uh, so we're going to kind of switch gears now into um, a couple of smaller, um, smaller subsets. First one is um, uh, differently abled characters, disabled characters. Um, things to consider if you're making a game that includes uh, characters that are differently abled, or if you're making a game that's about characters that are differently abled, is to uh, focus on affordances and accessibility. So if you're making a game for um, uh, people with disabilities, it's always primed to uh, incorporate gameplay mechanics that, uh, uh, that are afforded to them. 
Um, so if you are making a game for blind people, you want to make it more audio uh, sensitive or, or tactile. Um, you know, just take into account who your audience is. If you're making a game about differently able characters, um, you might want to work on uh, kind of recreating the experience, like sensory changes. You know, if you're making a game about someone who's colorblind, make your graphics <laughs> reflect that, make them look colorblind. Um, and make sure, again, that the disability isn't the defining point of what makes that character. Um, a, a great example of a game that kind of is, uh, works in the sensory deprivation is a game called Deep Sea, uh, which they've shown at GDC and a number of other places where it's, uh, it's played with this modified like gas mask diving helmet thing, and it's a sensory deprivation game where all you hear is these uh, like low booming sounds nearby. And the game is meant to be that you are uh, you're a deep sea diver and you're surrounded by all these mo sea monsters and you can't see them, you can only hear them. And uh, when you breathe, it get the audio from your breathing gets fed back into your hearing. So you have to hold your breath to hear the monsters. And you already can't see anything. So it's, uh, the, the entire experience is kind of a, kind of intense. Uh, people have uh, passed out from it. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it fits kind of with, like, if you think about it in, in uh, you know, category of, like, the S&M community, that would be a perfect game for that. <laughs> yeah, that would go over really well. Um, but that's kind of an interesting take on, like, uh, working with sensory deprivation as a game mechanic. Um, so here's some ideas for the things you can do with different able characters. A first-person game where you're in a wheelchair, all of a sudden stairs become an actual obstacle. Um, what if you're in a wheelchair and you're doing a platformer, you can't jump, you only have lifts and ramps to deal with? Um, what if your you know, character, when you're in the game, anytime there's a bright flash, the camera starts shaking and you have a seizure? Um, you know, or even if, what about you know, having a character that has missing limbs and you have to compensate? What if you have a one-handed character trying to do Tomb Raider? You know, trying, to, <laughs> trying to navigate a, a a, a, an area without being able to grab on the ledges, um, you know, kind of working within these constraints. There's a, there's a really uh, dense, fertile area here of game mechanics that nobody's really touching on, and it's kind of a disservice. Like, we're, there's, a, there's a market that is hungry for this content, and there's also a lot of mechanics that can come from it, and nobody's really working on it. Um, the next group is uh, displaced or homeless characters. Um, currently, 40% of homeless youth in the U.S. are LGBT. Um, and that's a largely a result of uh, kids getting kicked out of the house when they come out, um, having home troubles, things like that. Um, and nobody's really making games about this. Nobody's really telling this story. Even even the news doesn't really talk about homeless people. Like we, living in San Francisco, we're kind of surrounded by it, and we get a little inundated with it. It gets a little uh, we we see it all the time, and so it gets a little desensitizing. Um, but we are still kind of living with it as reality. That, we got a bunch of homeless people, and they're LGBT. They're, they're part of our community. Um, so ways to kind of uh, incorporate uh, this topic is to shine light on the real world issue. Make sure that you're talking about you know ways to uh, deal with this problem in the real world. Um, Destigmatize it. Make so <clears throat> make it so that um, the, uh, the characters and the subject matter isn't um, isn't meant to be vilified, and also humanize the victims. That's the main part. Uh, with with a lot of these is to make sure that if you're representing these characters that they aren't put as like tragic heroes they aren't put as uh, these uh, stereotypical tropes um, make them living breathing uh, characters that are interesting and have dynamic backstories you know a lot of the homeless people that I've met in, in uh, San Francisco here um, they always have interesting stories about kind of their fall from grace <laughs> if you will um, you know there's a lot there's a lot to it so. Um, so interesting characters that are homeless in games currently. There isn't a lot of them, but I think uh, Walking Dead did one really excellently named Chuck in the first season. Um, he, he's interesting because when they meet him, some of the characters make a comment about, oh, he's homeless, and they're like, well, we're all homeless. It's the zombie apocalypse. Like, <laughs> it doesn't really matter if he's homeless if none of us have a home. So um, and it, it was kind of this humanizing moment where they kind of realized, oh, he's just a dude like us now. You know, if they, once they remove that kind of social class barrier. Um, Last Pick Productions did a, a Kickstarter for a game called iBeg, which thankfully they changed the name to more general homeless. Um, and it's kind of this pixel version game where you are playing as a video game developer and you get your you get laid off and then all of a sudden you you know months go by and your your savings dwindle and you have to sell everything and then you end up homeless. 
and it's about uh, surviving in the street and keeping your spirits up and keeping your hygiene up. So you have to like go to the beach and, and take a shower there and save up money for like soap and food and just general things. Uh, I think it was great because they actually uh, made the game kind of as a charity for uh, donating money to uh, actual homeless uh, programs. So I thought that was great. Um, and this is kind of a way to not do it. Uh, in Tony Hawk, they have a character called Ali the Magic Bomb. And he's called that because in one of the levels, he you have to skate over him as like a ramp. And he kind of teleports from like one place to another. You just see him in a bunch of different places. And it's kind of the idea of like, he's just a prop. He's not a human. He's just a thing. And, and it's like, yeah, it's, it's great that you have a homeless character, but he's not a character at this point. He's just, he's just scenery. You know, why even bother at that point? Uh, this one came out a little while ago called Spent, and it's a game about living 30 days when you're basically out of a job and, and uh, losing, hemorrhaging money really quickly. Um, and it's a really interesting, kind of uh, hard to play game actually. But not hard in the fact that it's difficult, but hard like emotionally, because uh, it's really quick to see how, how quickly money just like flows out and, and how hard it is to live on like a really low, low amount of money. Um, and then this is a game that I actually made for a game jam. Um, a, it's kind of a panhandling simulator about San Francisco. And um, the thing that I thought was funny about this was that when, during the, during the game jam it was made, made with, people got like absolutely crazy when I mentioned what it was about. They're like, they thought it was gonna be super exploitive and it was like making a joke about it. And it's like, no, you can make games about these topics without them having to be, without them having to be the butt of a joke. Um, some ideas for displaced characters. Great Depression carpet bagger riding the rails if you're doing like a period piece. Uh, a game where you have to collect recyclables to survive. You know, we see them all over San Francisco. Uh, traveling, uh, trying to travel home you know, to another state without money. So hitchhiking, uh, trying to survive that way. Um, or just general themes of travel and basic survival in modern times. Um, and the last, last bit we're going to touch on are characters with uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, this uh, kind of piggybacks on the um, the displaced characters issue. Uh, you want to shine light on the issue, just different types of humanize the victims, and avoid making the tragic dying AIDS victim trope where, you know, yeah, the character is HIV, that doesn't define who they are as a character. There's still, uh, there's still an interesting character. There's still a lot of um, things you can do with them that aren't, uh, they're not defined by the virus. So, uh, kind of some ideas to what to do with the idea of uh, uh, HIV in a game. Um, Take the plague approach. If you're looking at it as a virus, there's plenty of games out there that deal with virus spreading as a game mechanic. What if The Last of Us was about an airborne AIDS virus? You know, how would that change the, the context of the game itself? Um, or also, a game like Pandemic, where you have to, uh, you're a you know, viral specialist and you have to travel around the, um, the globe uh, fighting off plagues. You know, what if it was like, a, you know, Carmen San Diego style, which you know comes to you know, game idea. Whose HIV is it anyway? You know, it's a detective murder mystery. You have a bunch of corpses and a bunch of clues, and you have to fly around and try and stop the virus and figure out who patient zero is. You know, it's it's uh, you know not uh, it's not what you would, what people would expect. It tackles the issue. You you can do it in a way that um, you know mimics how it actually hap how the how the outbreak actually happened with uh, the Canadian. Uh, uh, flight attendant um, that, that they consider patient zero. Um, so there's ways to kind of mirror this uh, with real life things. So um, the last thing I'd like to close up with is um, following the good adage of practice what you preach, <laughs> our upcoming title that we're working on called Welcome to Grizzly Bay. Um, our approach to this is to try and use some of these lessons to create our character, such as having a conversation system that leads to your dating options as you go through talking to the various people in town and the surrounding area. Different, you know, as you choose different options, different activities and paths will open up for you to do things. For example, if you talk to somebody and they seem turned off, you get more towards the I just want to be friends or leave me the hell alone options, but if you happen to be more, you know, kind and, you know, flirty to them, they may open up to the more romantic options. Or at least the case of the Jane Silent Bob style heterosexual life mate or romance options. Uh, but an important part is having 
non-human, since this is, we have a mix of both non-human and non-traditional so, partner setups. So we, we're kind of segueing the, uh, the diversity issue of, uh, you know, how, uh, when with our game, we didn't want to make it like, oh, well, you can romance the black guy, you can romance the white guy, you can romance the woman. So we're taking this approach of um, making a lot of the romantic options being anthropomorphic animals. So it's like, oh, you can date the bear, you can date the otter, you can date the beaver. <laughs> and they're just uh, kind of being, we're, we're still using a bit of stereotype, but we're doing it in a way where it's kind of not obvious what their gender is or what their, you know, you, you really only figure that out through conversation with them. So you're uh, not uh, making your decisions solely on, on appearance. So, and the same thing with diverse non-character, non-player characters. So we're we're kind of fleshing out our, our world with um, characters that are uh, more diverse and interesting and uh, things you wouldn't expect. Um, you know, and this is this is just good general advice for like any any game really. Um, and so, in kind of a general review, it's like uh, you know Minecraft, Animal Crossing, and Bara dating sim. So. <laughs> This, this particular uh, game is actually called Meat Log Mountain, and I highly, <laughs> highly recommend it. There aren't many games out there that, um, that I can say I've played that make me blush. <laughs> this, this game, it, it's actually got a really in-depth uh, dating sim setup for it, and it's one of the few games that I've played where actually, you know, the, the romantic options felt genuine, felt real, and actually were kind of erotic, and I was like, kind of surprised by it. Um, I think uh, development may have ceased on it like 2011, but it's still so floating around me. Um, so yeah, in closing, just what go more. <laughs> Meat Log Mountain. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in closing, just uh, go make more queer games, include more queer characters, and you know, don't be afraid to tackle weird, diverse subject matter. We don't have anyone to answer to. We don't have to ask permission from anyone. We're at a point now where the gatekeepers are gone or they're out on vacation. And we can uh, we can do whatever we want with games. We don't have to be restricted by anyone. So thank you. Focus less on the sexuality as being a a main element. Then, um, yeah. Just since the characters are kids. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a that's kind of a touchy subject because by and large, GLBT people are defined by sexuality. So it, you're you're crossing this gray area of like, how do we make something that's kid friendly and also sexual? Um, so I think the way to do that is to give them positive positive role models in game. If you're going to include gay characters, have like you know, I think uh, Night in the Woods is a great example. They have. Um, uh, the character Angus and I forget the other name. It's a wolf and a bear, and they're great because they're a gay couple. But it's like not—they do it in a really uh, nonchalant way. It's like not overt, um, and so you just see them and they're holding hands. And they're just like they're, they're doing couple things, but it's not put in a way where they're where it's called out that that's different. Um, I think that's probably the, the easiest way to go about uh, doing characters in a game or doing characters in a kids game or characters for kids um, is to just. Uh, Keep the sex part out, but keep the romance, keep the sexuality in that regard. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, so you talked about making games focused on different things, but how do you do something like showing disability, like someone being in a wheelchair, and making things obstacles without sending across the message that all these obstacles make them helpless, as opposed to people who don't have. That's a great question. Um, that's actually something that I was thinking about myself because um, you want to make you want to make the game empowering without making a value judgment on them. Um, and I think the easiest way to do that is make it so that they can um, they can get over the obstacles in interesting ways and maybe not focus on uh, the failure states for that. It's like if they're you know if you're making a game where characters in a wheelchair, um, you know make uh, a you know, perfect example would be you know, if you're in like a first-person first-person shooter style game in a wheelchair. Um, maybe as you go along, you can uh, purchase upgrades to get handicap accessible ramps. You know, might might have things that change the environment where the game isn't focused on the wheelchair part. It's focused on uh, making changes in the environment to overcome the obstacle. So you want to make it so that it's the disability isn't the focus of it. 
but it's an element of it, so that it's present, but not, um, but not focused on it. So um, yeah, I think we're uh, we're wrapped up for time. But thank you all for coming. <laughs>